I'm going to introduce our two speakers for today, and our first speaker will be Joan McIntyre. She's an Extension Master Gardener who focuses on a range of sustainable landscape best practices. Um, I'll just also add that she um, has spearheaded our program called Neighborhood Champions, which is all about bringing um, good, sound scientific research um, to, our to all of our neighbors. So that's been an excellent program that Joan has spent a lot of time and energy on. Molly Newling, our second speaker today, has been a master gardener since 2013 and brings 50 years of gardening experience to the organization. She's a member of the master gardening pruning team and works regularly at the help desk while maintaining her townhouse garden, a community vegetable plot, and working to improve the grounds of her church. So I'm pleased to have both of them here with us today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to them. So Joan, you want to kick us off? I'm Joan McIntyre. Um, and just to, for those people that are new to Master Gardeners, we're um, trained volunteers by the Cooperative Extension, and we have, you know, horticultural knowledge, so it's all scientific based, and, and basically our main goal is educating the public, so we do that through the help desk, which continues to operate through the um, pandemic um, by taking emails, although in plant, plant clinics, however, are suspended until we can get back to doing things in personal, but we still are offering these classes on a virtual forum and our demonstration gardens are open for people to come in and look and see what we do. And I would encourage people to also check out our website, mgmv.org. There's a huge amount of information there um, that you can get and there's some other research tools. So what we're gonna work through is kind of thinking a little bit about you know, what's happened this year and what's, what, we, what we can think about learning from this year's experience and, and moving forward to next year and then thinking um, planting for fall because fall's actually a good time to do a lot of planting. Um, and then we'll go into garden cleanup and supporting wildlife through the winter. And then finally um, focus on tool maintenance. Next slide. So it's really a good chance now to actually really sit back and, and celebrate your success. I mean, we've gone through three seasons now into blooming of flowering um, ephemerals and, and shrubs and dogwoods, as well as a lot of summer blooms. And now we're into the kind of fall area. Colors are on leaves, are, colors are starting to change on trees and, and there are some um, asters and goldenrods still in bloom. So um, plants are resilient. And I think this year it's been particularly important for us because we've all um, had to be spending a lot more time in our homes and gardens uh, so that we're um, so much more aware of what's going on. Um, and again, you know, things generally have grown and they've changed, um, even though sometimes we struggle with some things. So I think we can take comfort in the resilience that we see within, within our own yards. So anyway, now is not a good time. It is a good time to look back and, and think about um, what, what's worked and what hasn't worked and then what you might want to do for, for next year um, and get that um, going so that there'll be less work for you to do um, next year. Now, what were the surprises? What things worked really well for you? What, did it, what problems did you have? Um, you know, what were the plants that, that were doing well and, and which ones were struggling? Um, did you have weeds or invasive? I mean, this year I seem to have an overabundance of weeds, particularly in the spring. Um, so that kept me really busy. So kind of seeing where they are and how you might actually reduce the, the amount of weeds that you're seeing. Have you had water issues, either too much water or areas where actually things might be too dry? Um, are you seeing signs of erosion? Um, so those are all things of, of things that you want to take care of. And then most important, since a lot of us have actually spent time and more time in our yards than we have in the past, it's a good time to think about what more do we want and what would we like to do in our yard. Um, so you, know, you can start to plan forward in terms of where you want to go um, in the future. Next please. The problems, you know, you know, what things didn't do, you know, did your plant, some plants just not do well or, or even in die on you as well. You know, they basically failed to thrive. Um, you know, sometimes it's a matter, was it getting too much sun or too little sun? Is it, and, and some that it really comes down to the right plant in the right plat, place. Was it, did it have too much moisture, too little moisture? Um, those are things to, to, to look at. Um, did you change something? Did you, were you working in an area 
um, that might have affected it. Um, sometimes, obviously, most of us know that if you lose a big tree, that changes the whole dynamic. So plants that may have done well there won't do well, and others that gives you an opportunity to put other things in. Uh, did you have disease problems or insect problems? Or were plants just not really seeming to grow very well? Um, kind of listless. Again, thinking about that, you know, um, can you move those plants to a more suitable location? You might want to look at do a soil test to see whether or not you've got the right nutrients in your areas. Um, and then for particularly for de d disease and um, issues of disease and insect is doing proper sanitation, um, cleaning out around that and pr pruning um, shrubs in that to get a little bit of airflow. Although we'll talk about pruning a little bit later as to when appropriate to do that. But, but thinking about you know, how you can make the um, areas healthier and reduce and eliminate the problems that you may have had last year. And then mostly is you know if it's a plant, and there are some plants like I know my lilac and peonies always end up with a good bit of um, of, of powdery mildew and, and other leaf spot diseases. Um, so you know either are you willing to live with that in order for you know the blooms that you get and when the, the plants are are at their best, um, or do you want to maybe think about replacing that plant with something else that will do better? So there's all sorts of ways of thinking about, um, you know, what's working and what's not working and what things you, you might want to do about it. Uh, next slide. Now on water issues, there's certainly, you're going to see, you see signs of erosion. And we've had, even though the, the weather has been a little bit more even in terms of rain this year, um, we've, we've had our share. Um, so, you know, is, is you know, when we get heavy rains, do you see signs of erosion? Are you having like standing water after rain, especially water that isn't going to um, work into the soil within a day or two? Um, it can also create compaction um, and dry. And, and then there's actually other areas that, that may be actually too dry. I know in my yard, it, it, it's on kind of a slope. So when it's a diagonal slope, so I've got one corner in the back of the yard that's actually almost perpetually wet until we get to extended um, periods of dryness. Um, but in other areas, it's, it's actually can be very dry and consistently dry. So being aware of those issues um, and thinking about um, what you can actually do to um, address those issues and, and kind of really separate the different areas of, of, the, of your yard in doing that. So, I mean, the big solution here is almost always plants. Um, right plant, right place. Um, and in the handout we've given you, there's a lot of resources in terms of where you can find um, good native plants. And we strongly encourage native plants because they're more adapted to this area. Um, plus they're more beneficial for the wildlife because of the relationship between insects, birds, and, and plants. So that it's important to you know focus on on getting those um, native plants there to help support um, our wildlife and, and really the things that that make make the, make everything work the way it's supposed to and have a strong ecology. Trees in particular will will absorb a lot of water. You can actually then also think about ways of diverting some of the rain rain you hit into um, rain gardens that will hold it or bioswales, which are essentially kind of think of, of, of little rivers or that, that you kind of direct water to go into a certain place. And, and also it slows down the, the flow of water so that you can um, reduce the amount of runoff that goes off of your property and actually retain the water within your place. Uh, rain barrels are great options for catching some of the rainwater that comes off of your, um, off of your roofs. Um, and then you can actually use that water instead of using your um, the municipal water for, for watering your plants. But again, that's a, a good way to slow down the, the amount of, of rains. And then think about impervious, impervious pavement or replacing impervious, impervious um, surfaces with pervious pavements or walkways. Um, and that way it will be, again, capturing the water onto your site. I would recommend um, Arlington County has a good website and has some resources there, including some videos for recent tra training programs on how to um, kind of water, 
manage water problems in your property. So uh, that's a good place to, to check out um, if you wanna get some more detail. And, and we usually do have programs in the spring about how you can actually um, think more detailed about dealing with these types of water problems. So it, it's just at this point is, is thinking and being aware of, of what the problems are. Um, also point out is that Arlington, Alexandria, and Fairfax County all have different programs that will help homeowners to actually install some of these measures to control water and reduce the runoff that's going into the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Now that you've kind of assessed what your problems are and what the issues are, you might want to just think a little bit of, of having a plan. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate is the plan shown on the left. It could be just something very loosely sketched out, but kind of deciding, you know, wh where you want to um, put things, how you want to change what's in your yard, how you want to highlight or expand on, on what's working in your yard, um, and then kind of thinking about um, different things that you might do is, you know, how do you want to use your yard? Basically thinking of, of creating rooms in different parts of the areas that you can sit, sit outside. Would you think about adding more trees and shrubs? Um, those are extremely important for the environment um, for a number of different different reasons, and they can also be used to shade your house and make things cooler and more comfortable. So um, that's a good place to start with planning. Is that's what kind of adds some of the structure to your yard. So think about where you might want to reduce those. A reducing lawn is actually another good thing to think about is, is lawn is actually pretty equivalent to being an impervious surface. Um, it's a monoculture. It requires a lot of time, effort, and energy for, for people to maintain, especially if they're striving for those pristine standards of, of weed-free and eternally green lawns. Reducing that might actually um, be better for the environment could actually reduce the amount of work that you have to do. I talked about, you know, putting sh trees, shrubs um, in ways that actually help um, make things cooler for your house and cools your, your site work, reduces some of that urban heat, heat, heat impact and makes and can actually save you on, on money. I mean, one thing to think about in particular is by shading an air conditioner, it will actually um, be much more efficient and save you on money like that. And then what do you want to, um, you know, do you want a vegetable garden? Where's a good location for that? Um, do you want to support pollinators? Um, what kinds of plants and where would you like to put some of those shrubs in that? So all those types of things you can kind of scale in as, as you kind of walk through a plan and, and kind of help start to visualize where you're going. That doesn't mean you have to do everything that you want immediately, but it gives you a, a way of going ahead and if you're like me, my plan changes constantly is, is, you know, I do things and see what works and what doesn't work and what I like, or I learn more things and decide I want to go in a bit of a different direction. So plans can always be changed, but if you don't have one, you may not quite get what you're trying to achieve. Again, it's, it's just a way of thinking about your yard more systematically as you move forward and thinking about what you want to do. Again, yeah, mentioned this earlier, but kind of stresses that it's very useful to get a soil test, um, you know, actually repeating every three years. Um, and, and doing it now is actually going to allow you to understand, you know, what the, how good your soil is, what the nutrient content is, um, and you can start to do, take actions to amend it before, before the springtime. So, um, and one thing with so is usually you want to do a soil test for different areas of your yard. So you would test lawn differently from say an ornamental um, ornamental beds or a vegetable garden because the nutrient um, requirements are going to be a little bit different and, and therefore you can get more specific advice from Virginia Tech when you get the results back. They can su make suggestions in terms of what additions you might add to your, your um, to your soil to make sure that it's, it's healthy and, and supporting growth and what you want to do. You've got a plan. Now is actually really the best time to do planting, especially for your woody plants of trees and shrubs. Um, and you can put in, put in and plant or divide some of your perennials as well. Um, 
and add some spring ephemerals, um, bulbs for daffodils, and those types of things are, are all good for, for putting in into the fall. Um, and, and again, and, and the reason there is that um, it, as you're putting in these plants as, as they're going dormant, that they actually will um, spend all their energy in terms of getting their roots established rather than having to have energy in putting out um, leaves and blooms. Um, so again, you know, and it gives it, plus the weather is, is going to be a bit more, you have more consistent rain in that, so you, it's not going to put as much stress under the shrub, trees or shrubs, if you say planted them in the spring or early summer, is, is that's when it's getting to be the time of year that's particularly stressful for, for those types of plants. So again, think about, you know, what you might want to, to plant um, as you're going forward. So a couple of trips. Tips, uh, tips on, on actually doing trees and shrubs and kind of the biggest lesson here is make sure you know what the size of the mature tree or shrub is going to be and, and plan accordingly so that you're not planting them too close together because in, at the, in the long run you'll, you'll have problems once things get too big. Um, so for large trees that would be over the big canopy trees, um, you want to try to bring them about 20 feet away from the, a, a building. Um, so it will have plenty of rooms for the, the roots to actually spread out. Um, smaller trees can be a little bit closer, say about 15 feet from the buildings, and, and a smaller tree even, such as the dogwoods or the redbuds, can go, say, perhaps eight feet from trees. Um, um, shrubs, the thing is, is, again, think about what the full side is going to be. You do, if you're putting it against the foundation of your house, you actually want to make sure then you build in at least an area for about a foot between the mature size of the tree and, and the foundation of the house so that you have area for air space and you can have some access back there. So um, with shrubs in particular, we get them as, as very small plants. So we think we can plant them close together and then, you know, 10 years down, all of a sudden these plants are overgrown and, and too close together. And then think too about, you know, neighbors and fence lines. Um, you know, neighbors can cut and prune um, anything that grows over their fence, over their property line. So depending on, on, on your neighbors, but you know, is, is do kind of think of those things um, to prevent any problems or issues um, in the future. Um, and of course, um, with trees, particularly the large canopy trees, you also want to avoid the overhead um, uh, power lines. So, you know, anything along the streets, if there's a power line on your side of the street and there's not enough room of, of say, 15 feet or so from, from that power line, you, you may actually want to um, go for smaller, smaller trees um, in those areas because basically that too is the utilities can trim and prune anything that interferes with their power lines. And I think we've all seen some of those trees that have been butchered um, in order to accommodate the power lines. So um, thinking about all of those types of things. And, and finally, remember to call Miss Utility before you ever dig, because uh, you don't want to dig in and hit a, a power, a, one of the lines in coming into your house, whether it's the water line or the gas line. Uh, so, um, you know, be, take, take the precautions in advance to in, in deciding where you want to place your trees. Um, because they're going to be there for a long time. Next slide, please. So if you're planting a tree, actually the best way of, of planting the tree is a bare root, which isn't in a pot or a container. Um, and then and then you can, it, it's, it's less likely to be compacted, in, less, has less um, kind of filler and, and soil that, that you see you're, you're really working with the soil that it is, but um, one key thing in planting, um, as you spread the roots around, you want to make sure that the flare, which is that top part just between the roots and the, and, and the, the trunk, um, is actually above ground. Um, and then you, you, re, you know, make the hole deep and wide, or wide, wide deep enough to hold the, the um, hold the roots and, and, and allow you to spread and wide enough so that you can spread them out. Um, similar with the container, um, again, you usually are wanting to cross it, build a hole about two, twice as wide as, as the container it is, um, 
and but not not any deeper than where the um, soil line comes to the of the of the plant comes so that you're you're planting it um, again. And the other thing with containers is it, they're often can be actually very root bound. So you might want to very gently um, break apart some of the some of the roots because the, the more they're they're kind of together and they've shoved around, it's it makes it harder to actually reach out and move into the soil. So they basically are in a hole um, where they get all the water that that comes in, but they don't have any resources to um, pull out and get. Re um, so so you know I particularly with shrubs I seem to struggle. Um, when getting plants that tend to be root bound when you get there and, and trying to keep them alive for the first few years, especially as they're starting to develop a, a broader root structure. But, you know, trying to, um, you know, kind of get, get plants that don't have that real dense root structure in and then working to, you know, kind of break up the root sum so that it can, can actually um, uh, give it more more likelihood that it, that the roots will get settled in and, and start to um, spread out. Um, and, and the other is, and this comes usually with fr fairly large trees and shrubs, is, is ones that are wrapped up in burlap and probably held together with fire. So you do want to remove anything that they've used to um, hold hold it together, um, including as much as the burlap. And, and certainly all of the wires and nails and ropes and anything that's been done to hold the roots together as, as it's been moved um, before planting it. You don't want to amend the soil. Uh, it seems counterintuitive um, that you think if you add mulch and fertilizers, that's going to give the, the um, tree a better start. But in, in fact, actuality is using the soil that is in there makes it more consistent with the soil that's in the surrounding areas and makes it actually easier for water to flow in and out and towards the, the root system um, than it would if you actually amended it because there you've actually almost created a hole with, with different tensions so that water is more likely to stay in that hole um, much longer and then you have some root issues um, from the plant. So, Again, it's, it's counterintuitive, but just use the soil that's there. If the soil needs to be amended, you want to amend the whole, the whole area, not just the area where you're planting the tree or shrub. Next one. So then there's kind of planting trips. If you're going to do um, perennials is um, you actually, with this case, you, you may actually want to um, plant them reasonably close, depending on the size of, of the, you know, if you're going with small plugs, um, they can be closer, but, you know, that way is that they will actually start to grow and start to crowd out the weeds. Um, again, um, you might have run into issues where the roots might be somewhat root bound. So again, gently root, um, loosening the roots before you plant them will allow them to spread, spread more quickly. Um, uh, and one thing is, you know, if you actually get smaller plants, and this is particularly true in, in trees and shrubs, then I know we, we tend to like to have instant gratification, but um, smaller trees and shrubs are actually more likely to, to survive and do better because they, they have less that they're trying to keep alive. Um, I know with trees, you know, particularly those large trees is basically you've, you've the, to dig them up, you've done damage to the roots, so um, it's it's going to take several years for the tree to get reestablished and before it really starts to grow. In the meantime, the the a much smaller whip or, or a small container of a gallon or two um, is going to get established more quickly and could actually um, pretty quickly overtake um, the plant the tree that was planted. Um, in a larger size. So not only, and, and it's actually much less expensive as well. So uh, do, do think smaller rather than larger trees, larger um, plants um, is a good strategy. Um, and then um, if you're looking for a pollinator grant, you kind of want to try to mass plants in, in, in an, about a, at least a three by three area so that um, Basically, when you're attracting the pollinators, they have lots of flowers to go to, and they're not kind of searching among among other things. So, um, and then 
then, then, then actually kind of understanding some of your plants and what the growing conditions are. Some can be quite aggressive. Um, mint is probably one that we're quite aware of is that that can actually grow pretty quickly and extensively. So for some things that, unless you really want that, and there are some certainly good cases of having things that, you know, are ext will, will grow and grow, grow aggressively is and cover a large amounts of areas. Um, can be an advantage, but you know, if you're trying to um, kind of don't want something to be a bully and take everything over, you can think about putting things in containers or using um, hardscape areas um, to contain them. I know in one of our demonstration gardens, our mints get the mint, mint plant actually gets planted in a pot, so it's in the ground, but there's a pot there that's containing containing the roots and keeping them from spreading into the other areas. So. Um, kind of think about those things when you're selecting the plants and where you're putting them. Next. Okay, so and now if you're actually thinking that you want to put in beds, um, and even if you're, especially if you don't want, and not, not planting for next year, or even you can actually plant the trees and shrubs, but um, through this method, but this is absolutely your easiest way to actually um, prepare beds for, for new planting. Um, so a couple of months or six months in advance, putting down cardboard or several like seven or eight sheets of newspaper down in the area that you want to cover um, and then wetting that down to hold it down, but then putting several inches of mulch on top is, is a good way to, because that's going to smother, that's will smother the underlying grass or other things that you're trying to cover. Um, and then you can actually then plant in the spring. It will decompose. It will add um, compost and organic materials to the pop, and you're not actually trying to dig up grass and other things um, as well. So the, the, this is actually your good strategy of, of, of you know, starting new beds. Okay, so next one. Okay, so now I'll go ahead and stop for questions. Okay, uh, Joan, we have a lot of questions actually. Okay. The first one was uh, concerning raised beds. Uh, one of the participants has a raised bed that she thinks the soil is exhausted and may have insects or disease. How should she approach that this fall? Yeah, well, we'll talk about that a little bit with, with cleanup, but it's, it's good sanitation and adding more mulch. Okay. Um, if there's serious issues, uh, replacing some of the soil as well. And I'm sure you'd recommend a soil test probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But if, if for, it's not going to pick up disease or um, insects, but you would have noticed, you know, with you having those issues. Um, okay. Now again, it's, you know, whether, whether annuals or perennials in there as well, but sanitation is, is the best thing. And then adding mulch will add more of the nutrients back to the soil. What should someone do who has extreme clay soil? Uh, organic matter is, is the best and also look for plants that actually do well in clay soil. I mean clay soil is actually natural for this area. There's nothing really wrong with that. There are plants that have evolved to um, do well in clay soil. So again, with some of the um, guides for native plants, they will tell you what type of soil um, the plant does well in and whether it will do well in clay soil. Um, and again, if you're adding in organic material, that's gonna make it easier for water to, for it to hold water and actually to have some of the water not, not get too, too carried or get, keep hold the water in too much. So it makes it much easier for is, is a good way of, of amending the soil for, for clay soil. Great. Um, you mentioned not to put any amendments on newly planted trees. How about, is it okay to mulch a newly planted tree? Oh, absolutely. Um, the one thing on mulching is don't do, two or three inches is sufficient, no higher, and make sure you keep the mulch away from the, um, the trunk of the tree or of, in the shrubs, um, because it, if you've got and certainly no volcano, volcano mulching um, because that's actually going to be damaging to the tree when you have that mulch right up there. It's, it's going to encourage fungal, um, fungal and bacterial diseases. Okay, if you use 
the paper and mulch method you mentioned, when can you start planting? If you're doing big shrubs in that, you could probably plant right away. Just kind of dig a hole right where you want it or kind of move away the paper in that. Um, otherwise, uh, my experience has been is three, 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 two, three months or four months is probably sufficient for it to break down enough. Um, if you're doing it now and planning to part, plant in March or April, you know, that, that will be, you know, very easy to do. Okay, um, this is a little bit off topic, but one person mentioned that her peppers set fruit very late. Is there anything she should do now to prevent that from happening next year? Um, probably planting earlier, Molly, or would you have a, a better sense than that? It's, um... Um, I, uh, I find that peppers often do tend to mature very late. Uh, the only th to prevent it from next year, I don't think there's much you can do as long as you're, you're planting at the, at the, you have to wait until it's warm enough. They don't like cold weather. Um, in the fall, you can protect them with um, floating row covers and, and things like that to try to extend the season a little bit. And okay. just if you start them indoors or have healthier, bigger plants, that'll give you a head start so if, than, than rather just doing straight with seeds. Great, I think that's good for the questions. Okay, so yeah. now we're gonna shift a little bit to garden cleanup and my message is possibly a little bit counterintuitive, but there's actually, you know, maybe we could do less than we seem to think is normal as to what we should be doing. So you wanna go, go to the next slide? The leaves. I mean, leaves are a big chore over the summer, and but think about leaving the leaves in place where they fall, um, especially where they're falling into your your beds. And that is that's actually going to help enrich the soil. It also helps protect insects that that overwinter in the um, soil and often are on the leaves that drop into the soil. Um, so leaving them in place will allow those insects to mature and provide the ecological services that they do. Um, in the following year. Um, now, what you can do is on the lawn is, is, you know, if you've got too many leaves on your lawn, it's actually more likely to um, kill the lawn. So unless you want that to happen, you can use, um, if you have the mulching mower, um, just mull over the leaves and then that will just add it directly into the soil of your lawn and help enrich the lawn and reduce the amount of additional fertilizers that you can use. And then finally, you can actually you break leaves if you need to move them around. Um, I know there's some areas that along fences that tend to pile up too deeply and, and you can put them in your compost pile. Um, if you have an option, shredding them um, makes them quicker to de decompose um, or you can pile them up in, in some place in the back of, of in, it, in one of the beds out of the way and then add it gradually to your compost pile. Um, I, don't recommend doing what I did the first time I went into composting full bore as I took as many of the leaves as I raked up in the yard and put them in my compost bin. And basically it was too many leaves too close together. It was matting and you know by spring very little of it had actually decomposed. So um, kind of keep them, add them gradually to a compost pile, spread them out in part of the of beds that, that may not get as much leaves from, from other things. Um, but basically what you're doing here is, is you're letting mother nature do the work for you. It's, and, and that's, you know, if you think about in the woods or natural areas is nobody's out there raking things up and cleaning them up that instead that, that it de decomposes, it builds soil ecology and it creates that continuous cycle of, of adding and re-adding nutrients to the soil. So. You know, if we kind of approach our yard in the same way of, of how we can actually, um, you know, let nature do a lot of the work for us, that, that saves a lot of work on, on our own part. So, so next slide. So, and, and similarly is, you know, for many, particularly our native um, perennials, is it's better to wait until the spring to actually cut things back. Um, in some cases, like some of the ornamental grasses in that, um, and even some of the, the stalks with the, the seed heads on them of, of flowers is that they, 
they actually can provide some winter interest. They, you know, instead of having a barren garden that's just been cut back, you've got some something to look at that, that can be quite attractive. Um, and then the, the, particularly with the seed heads of a lot of flowers, that actually provides some food for, for um, birds over winter, um, coming through the winter. So you're, you're doing some good things. And, and then insects actually tend to overwinter much in the stalks and the debris of these plants. So, you know, by cleaning them up, um, you're actually going to do more, you're not supporting the, the, the kind of the natural flow of things. Uh, and again, it's, you know, with the same thing with leaves is much of the um, perennials as they die back is they can just be um, re, re reabsorbed into the soil and help build the moisture. And, and that actually serves from having to add extra organic material, extra mulch, is that you're keeping these things in the yard, letting them do their thing and less work on, on your part. And maybe just look at where things might need a little bit of tidying up. So next slide. Pruning. Now this is one area that we probably you probably don't you want to avoid doing much at all. Um, it's always useful to prune off anything that's dead, um, but generally this this time of year is not really a good time of year to prune. Um, pruning is actually fairly specific to the plant. So um, in one of the um, resources we have in the um, and the handout actually is a pruning guide that says, you know, for what plants is, what's the best time to, to prune. Um, in general, um, the kind of rule of thumb is, is for those plants that are um, blooming in the spring, that will bloom in the spring, they're usually blooming off of growth from this, this year so that you don't want to prune until after they flowered. Um, and then again, and, and, but other, other plants and trees are best pruned when they're dormant um, so that they can um, actually kind of handle the um, damage that's being done. Because again, you're kind of cutting off part, parts of this. So it's, it's an injury of sort to the plant. So, so you want to um, do it at a time when it's not trying to um, put a lot of energy into to growing as well. So doing it when it's dormant. Um, and again, we generally do have um, a couple of pruning classes during different times of the year um, to help, you know, to, to provide more, more specific information on pruning. Um, and even pruning of evergreens, it's not really good to do that from late summer um, through because basically once you've pruned a plant, it actually wants to grow. So it will start growing quickly, and then you will have this very soft, tender um, greenery that might, that's that's going to not perhaps not survive a hard frost. In that so you'll you'll end up damaging the tree. Um, so again, always always prune away any dead branches, but otherwise um, wait until a more appropriate time to do to hold off on, to do your pruning. Next slide. Now that said, um, kind of what not to, do, what you can probably think about avoiding do, there are some selective of things is if you've still got vegetables, um, keep an eye on the temperature and harvest any of those tenure, tender annual crops, you know, bring in some of the greener tomatoes um, before it, it hits freezing um, so that you can, and if you've got certainly any plants, um, House plants and that that you put outside in the winter is time to start bringing those inside um, for, for, for the winter. Uh, the other thing is, is to think about um, any, any plants that have had um, diseases or insect, insects um, is to kind of cut those back. As, for example, I've already cut back my peonies because they tend to get pretty heavily infested with um, particularly um, milk mildew so uh, or powdery mildew so um, cutting those back and putting those in and you can actually put them in the yard waste collection for the county collection um, do not put them in your compost um, because they that will just kind of spread the disease and any insects that you may have um, the composting facilities that the county uses are much more intense so they can get the heat up to where it needs to be to kill off um, diseases. So, um, so, and the other thing that um, 
I think is bad is is deadheading perennials and any anything that you find is too prolific in seeding. Um, my Rebecca seeds everywhere, so I'm trying to and actually seem to be pushing out some of the shrubs and that, that I'm trying to get well established. So um, I love the Rebecca. I won't think of summer without them. However, um, you know, kind of cutting them back as, as the um, blooms start to fade. Um, and, and there would be some other plants too that you might notice tend to seed um, pretty heavily and so that there might be a good reason to um, cut back some of those things. But, you know, kind of doing things selectively in terms of where you're trying to guide your garden and what you want to, you know, kind of encourage and what you want to discourage. So, next. And so, and then just a kind of reminder, usually in, in our area, the first frost is, is somewhere in, in, oct in, in no, early, no, early to mid-November. So uh, keep an eye on the temperatures and um, think about, you know, when we know you've got a frost or something coming fairly close to being um, uh, at a fr freezing level, uh, it's time to make sure that you, you go ahead and, and bring those things in that, that really aren't gonna survive a, a, a frost. Next slide. And then finally is, um, again, if you're, you're letting your leaves in place and letting your perennials die back to where they are, that you'll get a good bit of soil coverage from that organic material. But you, you, you do wanna look to make sure that you're um, covering most of your soil. It kind of protects the soil. It will um, lessen the erosion and mineral leaching soil compaction. Um, it also, um, will help suppress some weeds and winter weed growth. And that's one thing to kind of keep an eye out now is some of, I think those winter annual weeds are starting to seed. So, you know, the more quickly you pour them up, the less work you have. I mean, the chickweed last year or this year was, was pretty overwhelming in my yard. So I wish I'd have started working on it a little earlier last year. Um, but, you know, um, keeping the soil covered, um, you're, you're adding the organic matter um, and you're preventing, you know, it, it actually adds some insulation to the soil. So protects some of the plants as, as we go through freezing and thawing cycles. <clears throat> so it's, so it's, you know, but, you know, hopefully, you know, as your garden matures that you can identify those areas that need some extra soil cover. Um, but that's you know, a, another good way to, to kind of get ready for winter is, is to take a, take a look at that. Next. So um, again, I kind of covered a lot of this is, is you know, um, using whatever organic matter is in your yard um, and then bringing in actually mulch. Um, I tend to like the leaf mulch that we get from the county. Um, or compost um, from your yard, what you know, what what you can find. Cover crops is another option that's particularly good for vegetable gardens. I know in our, our vegetable gardening gardening programs, we, we talk some about that. But or if you've got a, an area that you've say cleared out and you're not planning to plant in the spring, you might put it in a cover crop. Um, you can get seed mix from from different um, retailer um, nurseries or um, seed sellers, but um, and that will, you know, allow something to grow um, and then it could be cut back and you just drop the organic material into the, in, leave them in, in, in the area and that will, you know, kind of add organic material to the spread while keeping the soil covered during, during the winter months or during any months that you're not um, planning on, on growing anything or... Next. Um, and then finally is, is think about the wildlife and, and particularly supporting birds throughout the winter. Um, you know, do make sure that you, you can have a bird bath. Um, you can't get heat at bird baths, otherwise kind of keep an eye on it and get rid of ice and, and refresh the water. Um, always helps to clean, clean and, and refresh the water every few days in the bird bath anyway. Um, as I mentioned before, is, is not cutting back your perennials that will help protect the insects as well as provide seed heads for, um, for birds um, way of, of naturally. And then you can also look at um, in your planning is think about what native plants are actually going to provide um, berries for 
for fruits, such as the picture on the right there is a winter, winter, winterberry holly. Um, has you know stunning, stunning berries, um, very attractive, but also very good for the birds. Um, but again, you know, in in native, in plants that are native to ours are much going to be much better for the the birds. And that is again, it's that's what they've evolved with. So next. And then, of course, feeding the birds in the winter is, is have your bird locations and areas where, where cats aren't likely to, you know, watch for them, you know, good, good way away from shrubs and brushes where they can hide, hide from, um, or ideally keep your cats indoors. Um, they kill an awful lot of birds and the birds are already under stress. Um, and then look at, you know, a good nutritious mix of, of um, seeds that have black mm -hmm. seed. Black, black oil, sunflower seeds, whole peanuts, niger, white millet seeds. And then there's actually the um, fatty foods such as suets or peanut butter, which are, are good for the birds as well. And, and there's special feeders that you can get for, for those types of things. And again, make sure you clean everything occasionally um, so you can reduce any um, bacterial spread and disease among the diseases. Um, but certainly the, the birds really greatly appreciate having that extra food sources um, during the winter. So, okay, next slide. And I will stop right now for questions before we go on to tool maintenance. Okay, Joan, we have a lot of questions. Uh, one participant uh, mentioned that her wood mulch turns into basically an impervious mat, so her plants have trouble getting water. Um, is there something she should add to the wood mulch to allow the water to penetrate? Yeah, I would probably think about removing some of, the, especially if it's the big thick um, wood chips. Is that that serve, that that works maybe for pads or things like that? But since it takes so long to break down, it's it's not for. But if you could mix it with um, something like a leaf mulch or that, that will actually um, break down quicker um, and and spread it around. Uh, so it, it doesn't um, form a barrier to keeping keeping water out, but is it will actually help absorb the water. Okay, thank you. Um, someone else asked, what is the best time and best method to deal with weeds? Depends on what the weeds are because they all have their own life cycle. Um, using, you know, having several inches of mulch will help suppress the weeds. Um, and of course, getting a strong growth of what you, you're planting will also help push out the weeds. Um, otherwise is um, kind of try to hit the weeds as, you know, as they're maturing, as, as they're, as they're develop as they're coming forward. And certainly before they, they go to, especially the annuals that tend to, to um, have a lot of seeds is, is get those out. And I try to be very careful when I see anything that's weedy that has a lot of seeds on them is to make sure that those certainly don't go in the compost um, that can go in with the um, county um, waste, well, yeah, landscape waste collection, but you know, try not to, to spread those seeds around. Um, so certainly the best thing is try to get to them before they go to seed. Yeah, Joan, another thought is if you have an area where you have large plants and, and uh, open soil underneath them is to plant uh, something very low, a ground cover or something like that, that will shade the, the ground and, and make it more difficult for all those weed seeds to um, uh, germinate. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on your situation, that could work. Yeah, the, the best strategy for controlling mulch is to try to get a good healthy, healthy growth of, of things that you actually really want. Right. Okay, um, they're kind of related questions. One is, should fall planting all be done before the first frost? And another person mentioned that their local nursery told them they could plant trees all winter. Well, you, as, as, yeah, you can plant trees as, whenever you can dig into the ground. So, you know, basically once the ground, if the ground gets too hard for, with frost and, and cold weather and you can't dig into it, then it gets impractical to plant trees. But again, plant, planting the trees and shrubs while they're dormant is the best for the trees. And it puts them in at a time of year where the conditions are more, 
are going to be more favorable for the tree, the, the, the trees and shrubs getting established. So again, yeah, and, and in this area, since we don't have really severe weather, um, you could pretty much plant most of the most of the year round and, and planting, you know, into January or even February can kind of work. Okay, Doak. Um, let's see, how about um, pruning something like it Itea? Can you do that all the way to the ground at this time of year or how should you deal with that? They go dormant. It's usually best to kind of do those. Again, check the um, pruning calendar to make sure that that's, that's the appropriate time to, to prune that plant. Um, and and what, what actually is the best, you know, some, some plants do better, do well if you, you prune them all the way to the ground and, and it helps to rejuvenate them. Others, you're, you're better off. Um, but, but look a little specifically to what the plant is, but I would wait until they've lost its leaves and they've gone dormant before you do any pruning at this point. Okay. Uh, actually, Itea is a spring blooming plant. So if you cut it back now, you're going to lose most of any of the flowers that, uh, yeah. Well, unless you don't care about that, that's, that's, that's a consideration. And really you don't have to cut it all the way back to the ground or at least not all of it. Um, so that I would wait until after it blooms to do any real sh pr pruning on that one. Unless it's- yeah, it Wait until after they bloom. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone planted a nine bark that is in too much shade. When should it be moved? I think probably best when it goes dormant. Mm -hmm. Again, that's, you know, um, when there'd be less stress on the plant. Okay. Um, let's see, is this a bad year to plant new trees because of the cicadas? Oh. That's an interesting question. Yeah, we're, we are going to be hit pretty hard next year by, by the cicadas and they, they can be somewhat damaging to, to trees, especially younger ones. If they really, really want to go ahead with planting, they could um, plant something small enough that it could be covered with netting in the, in the, during the, the, the cicada outbreak to, to try to prevent um, extensive damage. Yes. It depends on how, how anxious they are to really get that tree in the ground. Okay, that's great. I think you all answered a lot of the questions about uh, disease plants and what to do with them. So um, I think... Um, so I'm, this is Molly. I'm picking up now for, for the garden tool maintenance section. Um, you've, you've worked hard, your plants have heard, worked hard, and your tools have worked hard. So it's time to... Uh, look into how we can care for them as well. Um, because tools last longer when we, they're well cared for and more especially sharp tools make better cuts with less damage to the plant. So it's really important to keep that maintenance up. Um, clean tools also keep, help prevent the spread of diseases. People tend to forget that, but we have a lot of diseases in this area and especially with something like boxwood blight uh, if you prune back on a diseased box bush and don't clean your uh, cut, uh, clippers between every cut, you are going to just be spreading that disease to the, to the rest of your plants. Tools also are safer to use when they work properly and well cared for tools take less effort to use. So we'll, we'll explore how to make that possible. These are the general things that we have to do. Can do it throughout the year, but especially in the fall when you're probably putting your tools to for a little, down for a little rest. We have to clean them, sanitize them, sharpen them, repair them, condition them, and then store them properly. Okay, these are the, the uh, this is the equipment that you're going to need to do this job. You need some steel wool, usually a fairly coarse, at least a medium grade or higher, sandpaper and claws, a mill file or a whetstone, or this actually in the photo is a diamond uh, based uh, file that's uh, folding small so I can get into a small area and um, has, well, has a, a cover to cover it. So it's a nice, neat little tool. 
It's sitting on a whetstone, which is another possibility. Uh, boiled linseed oil or turpentine, which I don't have in the, um, in the picture, but this is mostly used for the handles of, of any uh, tools that have wood handles. Rubbing alcohol. It says or bleach here, and we tried to eradicate bleach from this presentation, but I see it's crept in. Bleach is no longer recommended for cleaning your tools. It's too corrosive, so you don't want to use that. Rubbing alcohol, 70% or higher, or um, actually you can use also full strength Listerine, but alcohol is probably cheaper and easier. A light grade of oil, like WD-40, uh, or a silicone spray or anything else that will keep the rust from coming on to your metal tools. A vise or clamps, if you're dealing with a big tool and you don't have somebody to help you hold it, um, that's always a useful handy helper. And safety glasses and, and gloves, either heavy work gloves or rubber gloves in, in some cases to um, uh, just keep protect yourself. So those, those are the things you need to gather together before you start this chore. Um, first is the cleaning. You're going to clean with uh, water, down, uh, with a hose or with a wire brush to scrape off all, any dirt and also to um, get rid of as much rust as you can. With, and use that with a wire, do that with either a wire brush or the steel bowl or with sandpaper, whichever turns out to be most effective. You can remove sap with either Murphy's oil soap or some other soap, uh, that's, that helps to get rid of the, um, the sticky sap, especially if you've been pruning pine trees or other evergreens. And then if you have a, a sprayer, a, a big chemical sprayer that you uh, reuse, you need to flush that very thoroughly with water before you put it away. Um, okay, at this point we have a little video here, which is supposed to work, here we go to give you uh, an idea of how you would sharpen, after you've cleaned your pruners, how you would sharpen them. So I'm gonna talk you through it as we go. Now this one, this is, these particular pruners had, were done used uh, on a, a, had sap on them. So like starting off with wire wood and some um, cleaning fluid to uh, get rid of, dissolve and get rid of that sap and then to brush it down with wire wood, to, to, uh, with a wire brush to, to uh, get all the stickiness and uh, off. And now we're going to disinfect them. This is alcohol, putting it into a large enough container so that uh, we can completely, actually I didn't put quite enough in, so we, but uh, so you need to completely immerse your uh, uh, tools for about 30 seconds. Now we're sharpening and holding the blade, the, the sharpener at the same angle as the blade. And you can see that how it, it sharpens up and makes the uh, blade shiny. Final step is to spray with a light oil and wipe that down and that will prevent any rust. Now your, your tool's in good shape and ready to be stored and used next spring. Okay. We just did that. Okay. Now we're doing going to do a very similar procedure on 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 shovels and and other cutting tools. Um, first, cleaning them off again, making sure that there's no actual dirt and residue on there. And then using your wire brush to remove as much rust and then and other de uh, deposits. And then drying that off with just a paper towel and checking the edge to see if there's any nicks. And you're using our sharpening tool again, running it down at the same angle as that edge of the blade to sharpen and you can see how it gets shiny as we, that means that, that the new surface is, is uh, uh, revealed. And then again, covering with oil and wiping down. 
to prevent any further rusting. And the same process with a hoe or um, a digging fork or anything like that. Okay. All right. Now, you, when you look, when you look at your your tool, whether it's a hand pruner or a lopper or a grass shear, there will be a blade that has an angled edge and a blank blade that doesn't. So you need when you have a hand pruner, you need it to uh, to sharpen only on the blade that has the angled edge. So only one side of that one blade needs sharpening. Um, uh, the same with the shovel. You, you, as you saw in the picture, we were only doing one side of the shovel. Some of us, if you're using a, a, a digging fork, then you have a lot of a lot of the, uh, blades, each one on each of the tines, and each one has to be sharpened. But that's um, uh, but you have to keep your angle the same as as the original bevel in order to make it um, your your tool work properly. Okay, now things also have to be fixed. They've had done a lot of work during the, during the summer. So anything that's loose, uh, handles, um, the screws that hold your, your blades of your uh, pruners together all have to be tightened. Uh, wood handles get damaged and sometimes they need to be replaced. You can usually buy replacements at hardware stores. Or you can also buy kits to repair leaks and hoses and, and uh, extend the life of your hose. So look at all your things as you bring them in and make sure that everything gets cleaned and fixed. Make sure with, with handles on tools, wood handles, smooth them down and wipe them. If you wipe them with linseed oil, you have to be very careful about how you dispose of those rags. Those rags can actually spontaneously combust you need to put them in a metal or glass container with a, and put the lid on. Actually, you can fill the, fill the uh, container with water to make sure that they don't combust. And that's considered hazardous waste. So you have to dispose of that according to your county guidelines. That's, that's a, quite a process. You need to put rust on uh, inhibitor on any place where you've had rust. You obviously would sharpen your ax with your sharpening tool and make sure that you um, oil everything metallic to make sure that it doesn't rust, especially if you're storing it uh, in an area like a, a garage or a shed where they will be uh, subject to some moisture during the winter. The sanitizing again, Soaking for 30 seconds and 70% alcohol, then rinsing and drying off. That is what will prevent you from um, transferring the pathogens from one plant to another. And don't use bleach or pine saw as they are too corrosive. You don't want to damage your tools, you just want to clean them. Okay, storing them. You've got them all nice and shiny and clean. Store them in a dry place. As I say, a garage, possibly a, 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 a dry porch, a shed, but don't let them stand out in the rain. Drain the water from the hoses so that they, the water in them doesn't freeze and, and split them. Soaker hoses can remain outside in the beds because they, they, do, they drain all through their length, so they're less likely to, they, they won't uh, crack. Drain your rail and rain barrels if you possibly can to prevent them from freezing. And preferably bring them inside. But if you can't, if you don't have a place to put them inside, turn them upside down so that they don't get water in them during the winter and then freeze and crack. And move any terracotta pot, pots inside, any, any ceramic pots, anything that is going to be damaged if it freezes. Um, metal's okay. Concrete is iffy. I would move those in if at all possible. Uh, so you don't want things to get wet, freeze, and then crack. And then you'll be buying new pots every year if you do that. Um, power equipment. For this, you have to follow your owner's manual. Hopefully you saved it, but you have to be do exactly what they tell you to do. Make sure that the any um, for any gas-powered uh, 
equipment that the spark plugs are out before you do anything with them, especially if they are a fresh cutting tool. You don't want them to start up on you while you're in the middle of cleaning them. So you will need to clean them, tighten any loose screws or bolts, go over them carefully, sharpen their blades. Again, to do this, make sure that the, the, the uh, equipment is non-operative. Change the oil, charge the battery, drain any fuel or add a fuel stabilizer. The fuel tends to get thick over the winter and you need to um, either drain it completely or, or add a stabilizer just so it won't do that. But um, I tend not to work with power equipment myself. So hopefully you've got your manual or take it to a, a, a good repair shop and have them take winterize your equipment for you. Don't forget you need to keep yourself safe. You need protective glasses, especially when you're working with power equipment, heavy gloves, a clamp or something to hold to tools when you're sharpening them. Follow your, the directions on your products. If they say that uh, you need to wear, use gloves, wear gloves. And be very careful about any linseed soaked rags and dispose of any waste products like those rags very carefully. Follow your county guidelines. Okay, so this is why you want to take care of your tools. They take care of your, they will take care of you and, and uh, help you for many years if you do, do the right thing by them. All right, you've done a lot of work. So now it's time to enjoy winter in your garden, those beautiful grasses the berries that are on the on the uh, hollies and the, and the uh, other late uh, shrubs. And um, if you want to discover some things that you can plant to give your garden winter interest, don't forget that we have a program next Friday on um, providing winter interest and uh, native plants that you can plant for that. And uh, I'm sure that you will get a lot of great ideas. If you have questions that um, we didn't answer here or you think of later, uh, as uh, Leslie said, you can replay this um, program in a couple of weeks from our Master Gardener um, help desk, or you can email our help desk. Here's the email down here, m-g-a-r-l-a-l-e-x at gmail.com. They're available every weekday, nine to a.m. to 12 noon and um, they will if you email them they can email you back um, information about your specific question. Uh, Colleen do we have questions for this? Yeah, we do have a couple Molly. Um, okay. It was such a wonderful presentation I don't think there was room for a lot of questions. Um, one was what how do you sequence the sanitizing versus cleaning versus oiling? Okay, um, cleaning first. Take off the, 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 the big dirt, the, uh, the, the dirt, the uh, sticky dirt, things like that. Then sanitize and then oil. Okay, okay? that makes sense. Mm -hmm. There was a question as to whether uh, sanitizing wipes would work. Um, they are usually alcohol. You'd have to look at the, at the wipes and see what kind of product you're actually using for the sanitizing. Some of them use alcohol, some of them don't. And the other thing is I'm not certain that they would expose the, have enough of the product in it to, to give you a good um, 30 minutes. Uh, so I feel more comfortable with the alcohol, but I'm not, it's certainly better than nothing. Let's put it that way, especially okay. when you're out pruning things in the garden and some some things are recommended that you prune, uh, clean, uh, sanitize your clippers between every cut. So that's that's a bit of a pain, but it does protect your plants from being um, inadvertently um, infected. Yeah, good point. Um, there's one final question that's a little bit more relative to the first part of the presentation. Is there anything you should do for your compost pile in the winter? Um, you can turn it if it's not frozen solid. And around here, that's a little less likely. Um, 
you can continue to add uh, the the uh, plant waste as that you as you uh, perhaps clean up sequentially, or if you're putting perhaps your uh, food uh, waste like um, vegetable clippings and leaves and things like that, you can continue to add that through the through the winter, and then put leaves on layer it as you would. Ordinarily, you can keep on layering it. It will decompose much more slowly, so I doubt if you'll be able to use anything out of it until springtime. Okay, there was actually a, a late question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any trouble purchasing rubbing alcohol these days? Uh, I actually did have to go online to get it for this. Uh, I wanted to get it anyway, but I certainly wanted it for this program. Um, usually, you can get it very easily at any drugstore. Yeah. But, um, and, and, and I'm sure that will be back again. But I was able to get it through, through Amazon. I probably okay. paid a lot more than I normally would. And you can save alcohol, correct? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I put it in, I deliberately put it in a, in a this thing that had a top that I could reuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that's it for the questions. Thank you oh, for great. this excellent presentation. I'm glad. Thank you, everybody who, who came, and I hope this helped. And as I say, if you have follow-up questions, the help desk is always there for you.